Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website. Would ask our guests here in-house to make that last check that your cell phones have been silenced as a courtesy to our speakers. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following today's presentation, and our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting our guest today is Dr. James J. Carafano. He's our Vice President in the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy Studies. He directs all of the work here at Heritage for our foreign and defense policy experts. He is a graduate of West Point and a 25-year veteran of the Army, a prolific writer, researcher, historian as well. He's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University, Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, and the Institute of World Politics. He's on the board of trustees of the Marine Corps University Foundation and several advisory boards. Please join me in welcoming James Carafano. Jim. Okay, uh, Henry VIII told his wives, I'll be brief. Um, or I won't keep you very long. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm here to introduce uh, uh, an extraordinary book about an extraordinary man, and we're just very excited for uh, Richard to be here. And so what I'm going to do is just very briefly introduce him, and then I'm going to turn the podium over to him, and he's going to talk and then do some Q&A. Yeah. Great. And we have a tradition of heritage. We always end on time, even if we start late. Um, uh, Richard Hunt uh, had a career as an Army officer, and I guess you got into this business being assigned at the Institute for Military Assistance at Fort Bragg, North Carolina? So that's well, really when I was at the NACD headquarters in Vietnam. Oh, okay, so even before that. Um, and he did, ser did serve in uh, Vietnam. Uh, he has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He served at the Army Center for Military History, where all great Americans serve. And... Uh, he is the author of Pacification, the American Struggle for Vietnam's Heart and Hearts and Minds, and other books and articles, um, and a great deal of research and work on the Vietnam era, and as um, which I guess ties in really, really nicely with this book. He is now at the um, OSD Historical Office, where he was first involved in the oral history program, interviewing OSD policymakers. Uh, he interviewed witnesses on the 9-11 attack on the Pentagon, and after he completed that work, which is some pretty extraordinary and compelling stuff, i got to tell you, um, he began work on a really just a seminal contribution to the knowledge of how the Office of Secretary of Defense works on how you can be, um, I, 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 I think, um, incredibly influential in a town in which it's really, really hard to take an impact. Anybody that can hang out with... Um, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon hold his own and not go to jail. He's got to be an extraordinary person. So with that, please join me in welcome Richard Hunt. Well, thank you for those uh, kind words. Uh, I would like to thank the Heritage Foundation for hosting this session and the two OSD historians who helped make this book possible. Before he retired, Al Goldberg gave me the opportunity to work on this project. The current historian, Aaron Mahan, provided unwavering support and sage advice. My comments represent my, my views. They do not necessarily represent those of the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Defense Department, or the OSD Historical Office. Melvin Laird was a reluctant secretary, but a major figure in Nixon's first term. He advised the president-elect in 1968 to nominate Democratic Senator Henry Jackson for the post. When Jackson backed out, Nixon turned to Laird. Laird accepted on condition that Nixon let him appoint his own officials. To Laird's surprise, Nixon agreed. Laird exercised this authority throughout his tenure. For his deputy, Laird selected David Packard without first notifying the president-elect. When informed, Nixon raised no objections, but was somewhat dismayed because he had tried to recruit Packard for a cabinet position, but was turned down. He later wrote to Laird, quote, I struck out, end quote. Perhaps no single appointment was more important to DOD in this period than that of Packard. Among other things, 
He handled two functions critical to effective defense, a more def effective defense program, acquisition reform and the preparation of defense budgets. Laird served during a period of shrinking budgets, anti-military sentiment, and serious inflation. Pentagon critics call for greater spending on social programs and less on defense. Armed Forces' strength declined by a third during his tenure, from 3.4 million in fiscal year 1969 to 2.2 million in FY73. The President and Congress steadily cut defense spending. Outlays fell from 78 billion in FY69 to about 73 billion in FY73. But when measured in inflation-adjusted dollars, outlays declined by 27 percent. Thanks in part to his politi political skill, Laird was able to fend off even more severe cuts that many in Congress sought to impose. Under the Nixon Doctrine of 1969, the President envisioned no future U.S. ground force involvement in Asian wars such as in Vietnam. He looked to scale back commitments in a time of scarce resources. He expected U.S. allies to do more. This represented a stepping back from the broad notion of the United States as the world's policeman and the lofty foreign policy ambitions expressed in President Kennedy's inaugural address. In keeping with shrinking defense budgets, the Nixon Doctrine and the policy of detente with the Soviet Union, the administration in the fall of 1969 adopted a less ambitious but more executable defense strategy, preparing to fight one large war and one small war at the same time. The previous strategy of preparing to wage two large and one small war simultaneously was discarded, essentially because the size and cost of the forces needed to carry it out were prohibitive. Scaling back the potential threat the United States would be prepared to confront in turn facilitated a reduction in military forces. With a declining budget, Laird wanted to prepare U.S. armed forces for the post-war period. But the Vietnam War was a major impediment. It was costly in lives, money, equipment, and political capital. Public and congressional support for defense programs declined sharply during Nixon's first term. In addition, the war delayed modernization of weapons and equipment and weakened relations with Asian and European allies. Under Robert McNamara, the Pentagon had shifted troops, equipment, and ammunition to Vietnam from other commands, including NATO, weakening their overall readiness. Years of Vietnam combat severely frayed the force, exposing racial divisions and growing drug abuse. This affection in the ranks weakened morale and discipline. Laird and Nixon set up programs to improve opportunities for women and minorities and to provide education, amnesty, and drug rehabilitation programs to help those with addiction problems. To build a future force, Laird worked to end the draft and establish an all-volunteer force. Laird interpreted the Nixon Doctrine as a way to help him control defense spending. He worked to hold down the cost of new weapons through acquisition reform and introduced the concept of the total force, that is, making greater use of National Guard and reserve component units. They were less expensive than regular forces, and he also worked to enhance the Guard and Reserve's uh, combat effectiveness. The total force concept was a pillar of the all-volunteer force. As other secretaries had, Laird leaned on NATO al allies to contribute more resources. He also sought to reduce the number of U.S. troops stationed in Europe and South Korea to save money. Lord Laird <clears throat> forged his basic views on Vietnam as a congressman. He had grown uneasy over President Johnson's Vietnam policy. To Laird, the war weakened the U.S. economy and his armed forces and was peripheral to core national interests. U.S. involvement in the war had provided an opportunity for the Soviet Union to enhance its conventional and strategic power. Moreover, Johnson's policies had produced only a stalemate in Vietnam and needlessly wasted lives and treasure. Laird entered office in 1969 convinced of the need to disengage from the conflict. 
He planned to withdraw U.S. forces from Vietnam while improving and modernizing South Vietnam's military so it could become capable of continuing the struggle against North Vietnam on its own. This program became known as Vietnamization. Kissinger and Nixon accepted the need to withdraw forces, but they believed increased battlefield pressure was also needed to facilitate a negotiated settlement. They wanted the Joint Chiefs to intensify Vietnam operations. Laird disagreed. Ever sensitive to domestic reaction, he argued that the public expected the war to wind down. More aggressive operations would increase American casualties and cause a further loss of political support. After Laird's <clears throat> trip to South Vietnam in March 1969, he recommended that Nixon accelerate and expand plans to upgrade South Vietnam's forces. The operative plans only prepared South Vietnam's military to cope with Viet Cong guerrillas. If American troops were to withdraw, South Vietnam needed to be capable of fighting North Vietnam's regular forces as well. At the end of March 1969, Nixon embraced Vietnamization, expanding the U.S. program to grow and modernize South Vietnam's forces so they could bear the full burden of combat against the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army. Laird <clears throat> saw Vietnamization as militarily feasible and politically pragmatic. It was his major policy contribution. He assumed that the new administration had a short breathing spell before war critics resumed their attacks. Laird doubted a negotiated settlement could materialize before public and congressional opposition became irresistible. Under Vietnamization, South Vietnam's armed forces dealt doubled in size to over one million, while U.S. U.S. military presence in South Vietnam dropped from 540,000 in 1969 to less than 24,000 at the time the Paris Peace Agreement was signed in January 73. Vietnam, a Vietnamization, however, entails significant risks. North, Viet North Vietnam was not likely to abandon its efforts to conquer South Vietnam. The Pentagon could not make South Vietnam's forces completely similar to U.S. armed forces. In February, February 1971, Laird emphasized this point to the service secretaries and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Moore. Quote, we cannot give the government of Vietnam all the capabilities U.S. forces now have in Southeast Asia. Even if we chose to try, the economy of South Vietnam could not support such a force structure, end quote. Vietnamization was designed to provide essential support, not to ensure self-sufficiency. South Vietnam's armed forces would continue to require petroleum, ammunition, repair parts, and technical assistance from the Americans. The extraordinary influx of equipment and supplies, notably during the Easter Offensive of 1972, scratched the South Vietnamese military logistics system to the limit. Assistant Secretary of Defense for Installation and Logistics Barry Shilato observed that the United States would need to provide financial support to the Vietnamese for an indefinite period just to sustain the logistical system. The battlefield performance of South Vietnamese Army leaders during Operation Lam Lam Son 719 in 1971 raised doubts about how well its forces could perform on their own. During that operation, South Vietnamese Army units, unaccompanied by U.S. ground forces, mounted an offensive to cut enemy supply lines in Laos. In public, the administration professed satisfaction with the operation. The press, however, called Lam San a rout of the South Vietnam's forces. Behind the scenes, however, Nixon and Kissinger were critical of how inadequately, inadequately South Vietnam's political and military leaders had performed. Then, in 1972, the enemy's all-out Easter offensive was repelled, but only with the massive support of U.S. air and naval power that Nixon augmented during the offensive. For political and budgetary reasons, 
the Secretary wanted a steady, well-managed transfer of responsibility for the war to the South Vietnamese. Nixon and Kissinger disagreed. Nixon, Kissinger, as well as the Joint Chiefs, sought to withdraw more slowly and to retain sufficient military power in theater to maintain military pressure on the enemy. Laird considered that approach, approach politically risky, leading to more U.S. casualties and prolonging American engagement at a time of growing war weariness. A slower redeployment pace would also delay the necessary process of reshaping U.S. armed forces for the post-war era. In addition, keeping more forces in Vietnam for a longer period would cost extra money, exacerbating budget problems, especially for the U.S. Army. Having the most personnel, the Army suffered the most severe budget cuts of all the services during this period. Laird outmaneuvered Nixon and Kissinger on the pace of troop withdrawals. He linked U.S. force ceilings in Vietnam with the numbers the declining defense budget could actually support. In September 1970, Wayne Smith, who was an analyst for Kissinger on the National Security Council, warned Kissinger the Secretary's actions on reducing draft calls and manpower levels had ruled out any other re redeployment option other than Laird's. Low draft calls and low enlistments and re-enlistments meant that DOD could attain the higher troop levels the White House and JCS desired only by drawing forces from NATO or other theaters. Yet the White House had valid reasons for wanting to proceed slowly. Kissinger rightly feared that regular withdrawals would be taken for granted. They would occur regardless of the capabilities of South Vietnam's armed forces or enemy actions on the battlefield. And regular withdrawals inevitably eroded any incentive for North Vietnam to make concessions in negotiations. The differences between Laird and the White House came to a head during the Easter Offensive of 1972. By this point, Nixon had lost confidence in Laird, and Laird knew it. He stood virtually, virtually alone within the administration in arguing that the cumulative effect of the improvement in modernization programs had given South Vietnam's armed forces the weapons and equipment they needed to defend their country. What they needed now, Laird argued, was, was better leadership. Additional equipment would not fix basic flaws. He saw the offensive as a test of South Vietnam's will, leadership, and the effectiveness of its forces. In his view, South Vietnam would not prevail unless its leaders mastered the challenge, challenges they faced. A skeptical Nixon disagreed. He had less confidence in South Vietnam's army than, than Laird. The president would not risk South Vietnam's defeat. He would not allow, allow its army to fight the full fury of North Vietnam's army without substantial U.S. military and air support. In the spring of 72, the president ordered a tremendous buildup of U.S. air and naval power to stave off North Vietnam's assault. It included 84 additional B-52 bombers, 163 extra F-4 fighters, and four more aircraft carriers went to the war theater. This was only some of the, some of the weapons uh, and equipment that uh, Nixon sent at this time. Laird complied with the president's request to expedite the delivery of weapons and material to South Vietnam. He initiated, initiated a massive airlift and sea lift that provided South Vietnam with more than 105,000 pieces of equipment between 23 October and 12 December 1972. But despite the flood of additional resources, Laird still believed that, the, that South Vietnam's armed forces needed to resolve fundamental problems of leadership corruption, the lack of geographical mobility of armed divisions, and high desertion rates. The differences over Vietnamization were only one of the conflicts that Laird had with the White House. Caught off guard by President-elect Nixon's plan to enhance the role of the NSC at the expense of the State and Defense Department, Laird objected from the start. 
He also resisted Kissinger's attempt to have a newly established Defense Program Review Committee, which Kissinger chaired, involve itself in the details of building the defense program. Laird and Packard ensured that the Defense Program Review Committee acquired no real authority over the formulation of the defense budget, frustrating Kissinger. Laird objected to the White House using private communication channels to bypass him. He disagreed with the White House in 1969 over the secret bombing of enemy base areas inside Cambodia. He supported the bombing, but thought the secrecy was a serious mistake because inevitably it would be, knowledge of it would be disclosed to the public. And he later resented the false charge made by Kissinger that he leaked the story of the secret bombing to the press. When North Korea shot down a U.S. reconnaissance plane in international waters in April of 1969, Nixon and Kissinger wanted to retaliate, but were thwarted. Laird and Rogers objected, threatening to resign. Laird further warned that retaliation risked opening a second fighting front in the Korean Peninsula, for which the United States lacked sufficient troops, equipment, and ammunition. Laird also unilaterally suspended reconnaissance flights so he could assess their costs and benefits and then deflected Nixon's repeated orders to resume the flights. Nixon was limited to mounting a show of force operations against uh, North Korea. He, could not, he did not retaliate. Nixon had agreed to, oh, excuse me, <laughs> Laird had agreed to to serve uh, in 1969 for just four years. He offered his resignation in November 1972, effective 20 January 1973. In accepting it, Nixon, Nixon paid tribute to his secretary in spite of their num numerous disagreements. <coughs> the president called him, quote, the indispensable man, the right man at the right place at the right time. No doubt the president was thinking of Laird's effort efforts to fend off catastrophic budget cuts, his handling of morale and social problems in the armed forces, his role in ending conscription, and most of all, the change of policy in Vietnam that led to the withdrawal of U.S. forces. Thanks in part to Laird's efforts, Vietnam did not become a major political liability for Nixon in the 1972 presidential election. By then, U.S. forces had shrunk to a small number, Draft calls were down, and the public had less reason to protest. Even Kissinger, Laird's rival, praised him, quote, he preserved the sinews of our strength and laid the basis for expansion. This was a major achievement, end quote. Laird's successors would not have to wage war in Vietnam, but they would have to ensure that the all-volunteer force remained viable prepared to fight, and that it provided equal opportunities for minorities and women. Laird's measures to improve race relations, increase opportunities for women in the military, and handle, handle the drug issue represented initial solutions to issues that would require more extensive resolution over time. These measures and Laird's role in setting up the all-volunteer force and the Vietnamization program constitute a no notable and enduring legacy. Thank you. So we've, uh, if you have a question, you just raise your hand. We have some microphones. And so if you would just wait uh, for the microphone and then state your name <coughs> until the agent so folks are listening online can hear the questions. That would be sit down or stand up? It, what, do you, what, what do you want to do? No, sit down. Okay. <laughs> I'm James Mazel with uh, Congressman Jim Bridenstine from Oklahoma. And I was wondering if you could talk, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, the, the parallels between uh, some of the things that Laird was dealing with and, and contemporary events from budget cuts to end strength reductions, all of that is um, very striking. Could you talk a little bit more about his um, defense budget reform um, issues and uh, initiatives? Could you talk a little bit more um, about that? Thanks. Okay. He, uh, he was a um, 
he didn't do get into the you know, details of building, formulating the budget. Packer did that. He relied on his comptroller, Robert Moot, who uh, was very knowledgeable. Uh, Laird handled the, the budget uh, in terms of dealing with OMB, fighting OMB for, to stop them from cutting, making further cuts. Um, he dealt with the president uh, to argue the case that you would cut defense too much. Uh, so actually, you have to go back to the microphone. Oh, because they sorry. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, so to, to, to Laird, in terms of the budget, was really um, uh, the person who was making the political case for preventing <coughs> lower cuts to, to defense, for cutting defense too much. Uh, he succeeded, and uh, it was F, uh, FY73. For the, the budgets he dealt with were FY70, 71, 72, and, and 3 and 4. He succeeded in 73 in making the case, persuading Congress and the President that defense had been cut too much. And so spent defense outlays went up for the 73 budget and went up a little more for 74, as I recall. So um, he wasn't so much arguing about I mean, he would testify a lot and we deal with questions about you know, acquisition reform and weapons development and that sort of thing. But his primary uh, his role, as I, saw, as I saw it, was to uh, contend with OMB uh, so that they would not cut as much. And if they wanted to, you know, he would always, he's always, always negotiating. Uh, you know, they, they wanted to cut so much, he would, he would offer to cut, but not quite as much as they wanted. So there was a lot of, uh, he's, remember he's a former congressman, so he's going back and you know, he's relying on these political uh, skills, his negotiating skills in, in, in defending the f defense budget. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, Bill Glacken. Curious, uh, was Vice President Nixon influenced by President Eisenhower in any way? I know the book is about mm -hmm. Melvin Laird, so forgive me, but uh, curious about that. And, and secondly, what intelligence um, issues were going on with respect to the, both President Nixon and, and Defense Secretary Laird at the time? Um, regarding the first question about, about Eisenhower, I think, uh, you know, the defense secretaries that Eisenhower had were not terribly strong. Um, and I think Nixon may have thought that Laird was going to be like that. He was going to be someone who, who would, you know, defer more or less. But Laird was not in that mold. He was, uh, it was a striking contrast between Laird and, and Rogers. Rogers really lost effectiveness very soon. But Laird uh, uh, was, a, was a player. Uh, on Vietnam policy, Laird uh, lost, as I mentioned, the president's confi confidence by 1972. But on all the other defense issues that Laird was involved with, um, you know, arms negotiation, assault uh, talks, and the the social programs, the all volunteer force, uh, there were no real big disagreements between Laird and in the White House on those. And as far as the intelligence issues, um, I'm not sure what what you were. Thinking uh, along the lines of the Central Intelligence Agency or even Defense Intelligence. Um, there, there was a um, – Nixon was, was someone who wanted to consolidate the intelligence programs throughout the government. Uh, he thought we were spending too much money on intelligence and not getting enough results. Uh, James Schlesinger uh, wrote a, a report suggesting ways to reform intelligence. Uh, uh, Nixon uh, uh, authorized Lair to uh, to get a better handle on intelligence and, and allowed Lair to set up a position of Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. And someone named Albert Hall was given that position in, I think, 71. So, um, and, and Laird always said he maintained very good close ties with uh, Noel Geiler at, at NSA. Uh, who provided him a lot of information about what was going on around the world and also gave him some ideas about what was uh, what the White House was doing and not necessarily telling him. <laughs> so. yeah. Jim Bass, Heritage Donor. 
Could you speak a little bit, please? Uh, by the way, thanks very much for uh, the, uh, the uh, very deep and insightful conversation here today and also your book. I wanted to ask you about the dynamics in Congress at this time. Uh, as you say, with uh, Laird coming out of Congress, he had a certain following there. But uh, can you talk about the dynamics between the Republicans and the Democrats in trying to prevent the Office of Management and Budget from cutting the funds for OSD further? Um, Laird, as, as a congressman and, and as a Secretary of Defense, made frequent visits to, uh, to Capitol Hill. He would uh, work with members of both sides of the aisle. Um, he was able to get along with, you know, with, with, with these people. Um, I'm, I think, I think, you know, we're talking about, a, if we're th you're thinking about the contrast between now and then, it's, it's a much different, much different time. And, um, he, I, he, he would, you know, he, he, he wanted to handle congressional relations, uh, and didn't want anybody else in the Pentagon to handle that, and he would, uh, as uh, uh, a number of people have noted, would make these frequent, you know, mysterious visits to the to the Capitol Hill to get quote a haircut, and really what he was doing was visiting with uh, with, with with congressmen trying to sell them uh, on on defense programs and you know prevent uh, defense department cuts, um, and I think he was pretty you know effective at doing this uh, as, as the secretary. Uh, because there was the tremendous, uh, you know, with people like Fulbright, uh, tremendous uh, antagonism to the Defense Department, and a number of occasions, Laird would be testifying, and wouldn't uh, he would give an answer, but really wasn't answering the question that the, the congressman would ask. Uh, he would keep going on so long that the congressman couldn't ask, answer follow-up questions. Uh, he had a number of techniques to, uh, you know, advance his case. Uh, and prevent, uh, you know, you know, you know, prevent things be becoming too contentious. But did he have an, indeed a following on the other side of the aisle? Uh, we would call them hawks at that, that time, uh, who would help to bring together thinking on the other side. Right. Yeah. Um, I think with with Henry Jackson, he's he, you know on most issues he you know he he was a compatible. Uh, he was an ally. But one of the things Laird found out to his chagrin, you know, for the first budget that he had to deal with, the FY70 budget, which was passed down by, which is really essentially President Johnson's budget, um, George Mahan, you know, in, in the House, who was normally a staunch advocate of defense spending, mm -hmm. came out in public saying he was going to, he wanted to cut the defense budget by billions. You know, and that sort of set a new tone that Laird had to deal, a uh, new atmosphere that Laird had to deal with. Uh, and it took a lot of, uh, you know, going through a couple of budget cycles to, to get to the point where people began to realize, well, we've cut the budget a lot and we can't do it anymore. You know, we've got to stop, stabilize it, and then <coughs> just try to bring, bring spending back up. I just wanted to dig in deeper to this uh, question of how Laird was such an effective mm -hmm. uh, uh, leader in the government. And But just to go back to, and correct me on this, back to your point about the question about how we dealt with budgets then as opposed to now. Laird actually had a, if I'm correct, had a harder time, right? Because you had rapid, just just rapid inflation. So every right. time you do a cut, right. do you want to comment on it for a bit? Yeah, that that was one of the. Th 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 I made I made a point when I when I mentioned the budget numbers that in terms of you know the dollar figures didn't go down really that much. It was maybe uh, seven billion dollars, but in terms of uh, the inflation adjusted dollars, it was like a twenty seven percent cut. And uh, the one of the concerns of not just Laird but the administration was that you had the inflation, you had weapon systems that were getting more and more expensive. You know, and we may be just pricing ourselves out of uh, what we can buy, what we can use to have for defense. Uh, and at the same time, you've got to, with the budget sort of constricts you, and you can can only do what the budget allows. You have to scale down your security pro national security program to what you can actually uh, execute. Uh, right. So they, they would cut, you know, they'd say you need to cut $2 billion, and cut $2 billion, and then inflation would wipe out. Right, wipe that out, and you'd have to 
cut billions more. That's right. Yeah. Um, so the, the so I wanted to kind of unpack a little um, and it, what exactly made Laird effective. And so you mentioned his extraordinary ability to work with Congress, coming from the Congress. He's very effective in dealing with Congress, independently of the administration. He he got to have his own team at the Pentagon, so he right. had a loyal team at the Pentagon, which was important because constantly Kissinger would go directly to people at the Pentagon and bypass Laird. That's right. And and he also never, uh, although um, Kissinger tried to consolidate power in the NSC and funnel everything through the NSC, Laird fought that tooth and nail on defense issues. And, and he also never lost his status as kind of an equal between Kissinger, Nixon, and him. They were kind of all on par. So is that fair to say the combination of those things would gave him kind of an independent power base that allowed him to really piss the president off, but still not kind of lose any stature in terms of his authority? Um, I think that, and plus the fact that he was very good with people. Uh, when I was doing the book and I was looking for photographs, all the photographs I seemed to find was Laird looking confident, smiling. Uh, he's not someone, Nixon, when you look at some of his photographs, he's kind of une you know, a little bit of unease and you know, kind of not very comfortable in his own skin. Laird it just sort of exudes his confidence, and he's a very, you know, friendly, outgoing guy, and he could make even people who didn't necessarily like him, he would, uh, you know, uh, work with them very, very closely. Um, and I think that was, that was part of it. And he was, he knew what, he, you know, he had served uh, as a congressman. He knew what the Defense Department did, and so he was not going to be fooled by any any people pulling wool over his eyes. And as you say, he he assembled his own team. Uh, he kept uh, people uh, from the previous administration uh, who were Democrats for a while. Uh, Harold Brown, for example, was one. He was sort of continued to serve as uh, Air Force Secretary. Uh, and Robert Moot was, was the, the, the person who was the, uh, the comptroller for McNamara and Clifford. Uh, 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 Laird recognized that Moot was a terribly dedicated and very competent, uh, accomplished uh, comptroller. And he thought he would do a great job, and he kept him. And uh, uh, he kept uh, Robert Persley, who was, uh, General Persley was uh, uh, the military assistant for McNamara and Clifford. And he uh, thought it was, he was, had done such a great job, he would keep him. And he, he looked for people with talent who would be, be loyal. Uh, and uh, I think that, that, you know, he was good at picking, pe picking people, and the fact that he had won this, right from Nixon to appoint his own officials was really, really critical. It's kind of unique, too. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Carl Best, working at Heritage as an intern. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the actual reform measures that were implemented, uh, specifically about the acquisitions policies. Uh, and then maybe discuss which systems were affected and how this affected the military's capability moving forward after Laird retired. Okay, <laughs> that's a, that's a it's a big topic. I mean, I'm not sure that I've got uh, you know, all the answers for that. Um, our our office is working on a history of ac defense acquisition policies, and unfortunately, <laughs> the the volume for the for the, the period I wrote about was, has not been published. But anyway, uh, Packard. Packard was, uh, the, the, the basic goal was the, the cost runs were another thing that we were eating at the Defense de Department budget, not just the budget, but in terms of political uh, support. You know, I've, a lot of critics would just point to things like the, the C-5, which was getting more and more expensive, and not, you know, cracks of the wings and that sort of thing. And we had to, uh, we had to, you know, not just for, just for the, dollars, but to, for public relations purposes, uh, you know, fix that problem. Packard was the one who really handled this issue. He came from uh, the Hewlett Packard uh, Corporation uh, and was uh, institute, instituted something called the, the uh, Defense Resources uh, Council, which looked at acquisition policies. Uh, and one of the, the things they uh, policies that changes they, they came up with was called fly before you uh, buy before you fly. In other words, not just sign off on something a long, a long for a long um, period of time, but stop and and you know a big project like an aircraft, you would have periodic reviews and then you'd stop review the review, review the progress at each step 
and then, then you know, you wouldn't move on until the things were, were resolved, the issues were resolved. Um, the, uh, there were a number of, you know, weapons, new weapon systems that, that came out uh, during this, this period, but I, in terms of the policies, I think every, every defense secretary grapples with this issue of acquisition because there's always cost overruns and there's always political uh, criticism. Um, and, you know, Packard later came back to advise, you know, he was head of the Packard Commission that, you know, came up with some a package of reforms for acquisition later on. So, so I, I'm glad you mentioned the OSD acquisition history series, which really is an extraordinary series, and uh, really looking forward to the Laird book. But I, uh, the McNamara book on the acquisition of McNamara years is really an extraordinary mm -hmm. volume. And, it, and if you want a great case study in, in understanding grappling with acquisition reform, it's really great. So McNamara came in, and all he wanted was we're going to deliver on time and at cost. We're going to map s system requirements to strategic needs. Right. And we're going to cut down on sole source contracting. And they failed on every single one of those criteria for every single system. Right. Um, and it was one of the most high priority things in their administration. And he spent like uh, six, seven years at it. So right. um, it really, it's a great, that's a uh, great book. I wanted to go back, um, though, and talk about the, the Korea incident and mm -hmm. the, the shutdown because I think that's a great case study in presidential crisis decision making. And uh, that everybody that ever thinks wants to think about how presidents deal with that um, ought to read. And so, could maybe you just unpack that a little more for us? Uh, yeah. Um, this the uh, to, to set the stage. The uh, this flight that was shot down was a routine, uh, one of a series of routine ongoing uh, reconnaissance flights over around North in the North, North Korean area. The flight never entered North uh, Korea's airspace. Uh, it was shot down with, with very little warning. Everybody on board was killed. Uh, Nixon, when, when he had uh, campaigned, complained about how Johnson was so weak in responding to the Pueblo crisis when the North Korea um, took over the you know, U.S. Uh, ship, the, the Pueblo. And he, Nixon, wanted to make a big statement. He wanted to retaliate, and uh, he didn't want to, he wanted people to know that he was, he was a different kind of president. And, and, uh, and so the first couple of days, you know, they're trying to grap grappling with the idea, well, what can we do? Um, and, and, at, and at this point, um, uh, Laird, you know, and Ro as I said, Laird and Rogers were, were trying to urge restraint, uh, and they they threatened to resign if there was this massive retaliation. Um, Laird um, and Persley went to the JCS and asked the JCS for a study of logistics. You know, what could we do if we had to fight another war at this time? You know, did we have the ammunition, the troops, the equipment to fight two wars at the same time? And the JCS paper essentially concluded, no, we didn't. We couldn't do it. Um, and this, you know, this this put was a, a real showstopper. Um, and then the other thing Laird wondered about, okay, we've got, had all these reconnaissance flights around the world. Uh, what are we getting out of this? You know, this is, there's a real risk to some of these flights. So he, as I mentioned, he shut down um, all reconnaissance flights around the world so that the, 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 the issue could be studied to see whether we were getting as much uh, benefit uh, as, as possible from this and what would, you know, where the risk may be too great. And this really infuriated Kissinger and, and Nixon. And, and Kissinger would send every week or so a memo to, um, to the president saying, Laird still hasn't resume, resumed the flights. You know, you, Mr. President, said he should, you know, issued orders on this day and that day and this day <coughs> that he should resume the flights, and he hasn't. Uh, eventually, you know, you know, Laird's response was, well, we haven't completed our study. We're still e examining the issue. Um, after, uh, afterwards, uh, well, what, excuse me, to back up a little bit, one of, the, one of the bodies that the White House set up to uh, deal with crises was called the Washington Special Actions Group, and it was chaired by Kissinger, and it was consisted of undersecretaries and uh, uh, pe you know, people from the, the CIA, uh, and they were to meet together and come up with proposals and, uh, and uh, you know, what, how to respond in a crisis. Uh, 
uh, and this committee, you know, at one of the, this committee issued an after action report, um, and what they concluded at, at the end of this uh, after action report, looking at this episode, was they were shocked because they realized the U.S. didn't have the resources to retaliate at this point. Um, that was kind of the bottom line. And, uh, you know, that, that I think really, uh, you know, affected uh, Nixon and, and Kissinger. Uh, Haig, for example, thought, Al Haig thought that was, this was the worst mistake that the administration ever made. They should have retaliated, but. So we have a question over here. Yeah, I just wondered, during your writing of this book, if you had a chance to interview some of these central characters who were still alive, including Secretary Laird. Uh, I interviewed, at the beginning of the project, I interviewed uh, Secretary Laird twice, and uh, you, I, he was very forthcoming, uh, and uh, he would sometimes get into these very interesting stories that were related to the question, but, and then he would stop himself and say, wait, I'm off track, and I would think, well, why don't you keep the story? The story was more interesting. But anyway, he, he, I interviewed Laird a couple of times. Um, and I've interviewed uh, Robert Persley uh, a couple of times, and also the uh, the comptroller, Robert Moot. Um, and they were some of the crit critical f uh, figures. A number of the people uh, were no longer uh, with with us or unreachable. Uh, to, but what the main? I don't know if you if you've had a chance to look at the the, the notes. The main source sources are primary sources. Uh, the Nixon material, presidential materials is an incredibly rich collection of, of papers. Uh, it's, Nixon was very good about marking up things and sending his own memos. Kissinger and Hay kept very good records. Uh, there are phone uh, tape, uh, uh, transcripts of telephone conversations. Uh, Laird has a set of papers that are out at the Ford Library. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, and then the, one other item, that, uh, the Admiral Moore, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff kept a diary, which was not just a diary of what he did, but it included documents, you know, that he looked at that during that day, uh, telephone transcripts, of the conversations he had with different naval people or with the White House or with Laird, uh, and it's, uh, he's very, very frank, and he, he obviously did not expect anyone ever to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, how things have changed now that yeah. you just say we can't find the emails and we're done. Right. Um, so b before we wrap up, uh, I want to ask uh, one last question, which is there's a biography of Melvin Laird, which uh, covers his whole life, but it has a substantial portion on right. his term as Secretary of Defense. And I just was wondering what your assessment of, of the biography is now having gone through all the official papers? Um, I, I used uh, Dale Van Atta's biography a lot. I think, I think he's, got, he's got the, you know, he, it's, I think it's a good book. Uh, uh, he did not um, have the same access to classified documents that I have. And I think, you know, for my purposes, I'm, I was just focusing on Laird as the Secretary of Defense. Um, and uh, Dale Van Atta was treating Laird much more broadly, you know, his whole life. And, uh, I think there's more of a political uh, focus on Laird as a polit politician in, in his political career. Than, yeah. So uh, we'd be fair to say that they really kind of complement each I other. I think so, yeah. That's, that's a good way to put it. Because I was looking, it. for example, at, the, the, at your treatment of the Korea incident and his, he's got some stuff in there that you don't, but it's, right. they don't differ. They're just kind of different perspectives. Right, there's different em emphasis. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I did, before we kind of wrap up and thank our speaker, I did want to say that since this is an official uh, DOD publication, it's on the OSD history website, right? Correct. And so right. folks can get uh, free access to the, right. the whole book, right? right? That's but, correct. But you can also uh, purchase the book. And we've got some flyers outside which have information on the book and how you can uh, get a copy. It is, a, I think, a, I think it's a, a textbook for that, that anybody that ever thinks they want to have anything to do with either working in or understanding DOD's role in the national security press process ought to read and, and have and, and learn from. Um, so please join with me in thanking our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.